they all the unions the, the all the union reps that I spoke to they absolutely would like to see an AP 1000 tomorrow in TVA because of the the growing demand that's needed and the fact that TVA as a mission organization it's not just a power company it's not just a state owned enterprise it is something that originally and can once again fulfill US government missions like bringing nuclear industrial capacity back on track. Welcome back to Decouple. Today, I'm really excited to be recording an episode about the Tennessee Valley Authority and its possible role and favorable position to lead the charge on new build nuclear in the US. And for this endeavor, I'm joined by Fred Stafford, whose piece in the nation, The Case for Public Nuclear Power, um, is on this precise topic and definitely caught my attention. So, Fred, welcome. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. And by way of uh, introduction, um, you are a STEM professional. Um, you publish regularly in uh, news magazines like The Jacobin, The Nation, Catalyst. Um, Fred Stafford is, however, a pseudonym. Um, we yes. have modified your voice uh, to protect your identity and privacy. Um, Fred, you're not the first guest on this podcast. Um, to uh, to have a pseudonym or you know have anonymity, um, Doomberg uh, has been a regular guest, and uh, we do some voice disguising for him as well. Um, just quickly before we jump in, um, you know, to settle this intrigue, uh, can you uh, explain your motivations for for maintaining your anonymity? Absolutely. Uh, the intrigue, yeah. There's there's no intrigue. I don't work in utilities, power, energy, anything of the sort. Uh, I just am very passionate about this subject, mainly for political reasons. I write from a socialist perspective, and that's not exactly the kind of thing that employers love to hear about. So to kind of just keep my political and research life separate from my day job, STEM professional life, uh, I use the pseudonym and have this very exciting disguised voice. All right. Cultivating mystery. So the funny thing about um, guessing your voice is uh, we actually recorded this episode um, just over a week ago. Um, and unfortunately, my microphone um, was not my studio microphone. Uh, it was a bit of an accident there. So we had to re-record because my voice quality just wasn't up to snuff and, and to the uh, fine ears of the decouple listener. But um, as we were just chatting about in our, in our pre-recording talk, um, I think it's kind of a good thing because there's been a lot of water under the bridge um, in the last three weeks. Um, I could say it, but why don't you catch us up on mm -hmm. on some some of the breaking news that is going to uh, make this conversation even more pertinent and up to date than it was a week and a half ago? Yeah. So chronologically, since we recorded the the conversation before, uh, let's see, we have the Three Mile Island deal with Microsoft to to restart that plant. We have the TVA releasing its 20-year IRP, the first one that it's released since uh, 2019. That's their integrated resource plan, laying out kind of modeled pathways of resource investments for the future of the energy system. Um, then there was, uh, just in the past recent days, truly devastating historic flooding and, and just human and ecological crisis in Appalachia in the United States because of the Hurricane Helen. And then um, just this morning, the new commercial liftoff report for advanced nuclear from the Department of Energy. So lots of new topics to discuss. And I've been perusing through that in the short time I've had before this interview. Um, that, that liftoff report truly is breaking news. Um, huge paradigm shift there. Um, one uh, key point being that advanced nuclear is now no longer just you know, liquid metal uh, <laughs> cooled reactors, but uh, Gen 3 plus um, conventional uh, light water, presumably um, heavy <laughs> water pressurized water reactors and, and BWRs are, are in the mix. So that's, that's exciting. But there's, there's a lot more there and we'll get into that. Um, before we do, just to sort of paint a bit of a background, um, we're in this moment of, you know, incredible social and political license. Um, you know, I think the most recent fad has been um, folks at college football games, which I sound are like, which I understand are like much more serious in, in the U.S. than kind of our Canadian sports culture. But holding up <laughs> yes. the "I love nuclear energy" placards, like lining up for like twenty hours in advance to to get there, um, so get a good uh, good shot wherever the uh, wherever the media occurrences are happening. Um, this is one of the only areas <clears throat> nuclear where the Democrats and Republicans um, have come to a bipartisan. Uh, Convergence. 
Uh, it seems like we've moved beyond um, the phase of saving distressed nuclear plants uh, like Byron and Dresden um, and some degree Diablo Canyon um, towards turning some of those back on. Um, as you mentioned, um, Unit 1, Three Mile Island, uh, the restart deal um, with Microsoft. Um, there are juicy tax credits. Uh, IRA is offering up to 50% tax credits uh, if you build nuclear on a brownfield site, union labor, local supply chain. Um, so, you know, a lot is happening and yet no utility um, is willing to step up to the plate. We had the collapse of the uh, carbon free power project um, with, uh, with, use, with New Scale, um, which was sort of the most firm plan for new nuclear um, after, after Vogel. Um, but as of now, um, there are no concrete plans for new nuclear. And, you know, we had Jigger Shaw on the show um, actually probably about a year ago. And he was saying, like, this is getting so crazy that people are suggesting to him that we just, you know, get the military to kickstart this and build these nuclear reactors on, on military bases. This was an idea that he uh, obviously pushed back again. So, you know, the question is, who can take the leap? What institution is best poised to do it? And uh, I think you have some ideas on the topic. So um, why don't we jump in? Um, you can start wherever you want, but uh, definitely want to get you know a backgrounder on on the TVA. But I'll let you uh, let you kind of take it away from that introduction. If you want to do some reflecting first. Okay, great. Yeah, excellent introduction. That really sets the stage of where we are right now. Um, so yeah, un unlike what you were suggesting before of kind of using the military to push for uh, kind of a mission based part of the government to build new nuclear, I am making the case for the Tennessee Valley Authority to do so. So. What is the TVA? Today, it's kind of known as America's largest public power system. It's the kind of federal government's power company, in a sense. Um, it's, but really, it, it represents this, it's almost like a state-owned enterprise in the U.S., of which we basically have none. So it's, it's this really unique thing in, in, in America. And it dates back to the 1930s, 1933, under Franklin Roosevelt as president. Still coming out of the Great Depression, we're uh, dealing with massive um, combined economic and ecological crisis in America. Uh, the Dust Bowl temperature shot up dramatically because of the, the farming practices at the time. A lot more of the population were agricultural workers than they are today. Um, and generally, there's just mass unemployment and an economy that really needed stimulation. So as part of the New Deal experiments of the federal government, for setting up kind of public works programs for employment, Roosevelt created the Tennessee Valley Authority. And a Republican senator in Nebraska, George Norris, was also a major advocate of that. But essentially, the idea of the TVA was to, uh, it wasn't to build power necessarily, it was more to modernize a truly uh, just economically depressed area of, of Appalachia, Tennessee and surrounding areas um, there was a lot of malaria, there was not enough investment in the economy, lots of unemployment, and lots of devastating floods on the Tennessee River. Um, and that's why I mentioned earlier the connection to the recent flooding in Appalachia, which is just horrific to see. But this was a moment in time where the federal government was experimenting with new kinds of ways to deal with that. TVA sought to build hydroelectric dams really for flood control and helping river navigation and then making use of them to generate power was just sort of this like nice thing that they should do also. Um, eventually, like pretty quickly, one of the early TV administrators really built up the, uh, the public power operations as a core part of TVA. And that was also something that Roosevelt himself was very interested in, uh, public power as a solution to a problem at the time of the kind of major capitalist villains of the day were these massive public utility holding companies. They were big electric industry titans like Samuel Insel. Um, and public power was the, the kind of way from the early progressive movement at the time to combat the power they had, to kind of compete against them. And so the TVA was this joint program for flood control, modernization, employment, um, and then also offering a kind of weapon against the private utilities industry that was perhaps not adequately electrifying the area and especially the rural farming communities. So TVA was one part of a major government approach to deal with all these problems. Thing in, in your article, you talk about um, these various phases, uh, the flood control and then the power production, mostly through hydro early on. 
Um, and you talk about sort of what the power was used for. Um, and I'm not sure if this is because it's a state-owned enterprise, but um, significant amount of that power used um, in the war effort, I believe, for making airplanes, making aluminum. Um, and then uh, for the Manhattan Project uh, to power mm -hmm. uh, uranium enrichment. Uh, so just maybe walk us through those stages and if there's some further stages afterwards. Yeah, so in 1933, TBA is created very quickly. Uh, they start construction on a new dam, Norris Dam, uh, that within three years is built. And there's some generators that are put on that. Um, and then there's a, a, a few more dams after that. But in 1939, the, they start commissioning new dams and new generators, not just for modernizing the valley area and bringing public power to them, but also to help coordinate production, wartime production uh, of aluminum. So there were aluminum smelters in the area that since World War I had been using some hydroelectric power in that general area to produce electricity to then produce the aluminum needed to build airplanes and things like that. So TVA was really put to work as a government uh, instrument to help facilitate wartime production of aluminum via power. Um, and that started with them building dams. And then in 1940, the federal government started to worry, oh, well, between the TVA and then other public power systems like in Bonneville, in the Pacific Northwest, we have all this power that's coming online to help produce all this aluminum, but we're forecasting a possible dry year for some key river systems. So what are we going to do about that? TVA directors at the time sent a letter to the president, put us in, we can do it, we're going to build fossil fuel plants. We're going to build a coal-fired power plant. And so that was the, um, the Watts Bar steam plant. It was the, the first fossil fuel power plant of the TVA. And it was in 1940 or 1941, I believe, that it started, uh, it started producing power. So that really represented a shift into coal, which then over the next really 30 years was kind of the behemoth of the TVA power system. I think people yeah. today think about it being hydro, but really coal was for decades the major source. Right, right. No, it's funny, just uh, something crossed my feet earlier today, and it was uh, propaganda posters, I believe, from the TVA and from uh, Bonna, what was it called? Bonna Bonneville, City? yeah. Bonneville, sorry. Um, and they were, yeah, war posters, basically, saying that these factory workers uh, and these power producers were, you know, just emphasizing and engaged in the war effort. And it's, you know, 19... 40s uh, style propaganda posters. Yeah. We'll, we'll throw, throw a few up here right now. But yeah. Um, so yeah, uranium enrichment becomes a, a big thing as well. Exactly. And, uh, the, so yeah. people, I mean, people probably saw the movie Oppenheimer. There's the scene of them counting marbles to represent the uranium enrichment. The uranium was being enriched at Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee. And Oak Ridge was chosen as a site for that facility because it was adjacent to the TVA territory. And because the TVA was the state capacity for large complex infrastructure development and operations that could then be used for that. So starting around 19, uh, in, I think, I forget the ex exact year, but around, around then the, the TVA starts developing more power, especially coal power and also hydroelectric dams to provide power, not for aluminum this time, but for uranium enrichment. And that really escalates during the Cold War through the 1950s. And the Atomic Energy Commission for Uranium Enrichment became basically the dominant, uh, the dominant uh, buyer of TVA power. The so TVA all along was right. selling power to residential customers, but also industrial customers, sorry, via re local resellers. Um, and all these industrial customers helped spread out the costs. So it helped keep prices low for everyone to, to stimulate all that. Plus you're stimulating local industrial production, which is good for the local economies. Right, right. Um, we had uh, Professor Alex Wellerstein on, and he had a great sort of history of the Manhattan Project. People should go back and check that out. But um, he clarified 1% of U.S. electricity was being used um, uh, by the Manhattan Project. I guess based on where it was localized, it was probably a higher percentage of the TVA's oh, yeah. total output. Yeah. Thing. Um, okay, so there's sort of a series of, I won't call them energy transitions. I much prefer the um, the moniker of energy additions. But hydro, you mentioned it uh, became sort of a coal-dominant utility. Um, what happened after that? Um, so after, after coal, and in 1955, the TVA builds the Kingston Coal Plant. It's the largest fossil fuel power plant in the world. But a decade later, TVA is this coal behemoth. They're one of the, I think, the largest coal buyer in the country at that point. 
uh, and there's a lot of coal in, this, in that area. But in 1965, they announced plans to build the first nuclear power station at Browns Ferry. And I, I, I read this old uh, newspaper article from a Knoxville paper, and it said the, the headline was nuclear power roars at King Cole. And it was, mm -hmm. it was just this massive shift and this idea of what kind of technology was available, what, how did this play with the local economy based so heavily in coal? And it was really predicated on dealing with the environmental degradation from the coal plants, the, the strip mining used to get the coal, but also the intense air pollution. So nuclear was seen as a solution to that while meeting the rising demand for electricity. Um, and that rising demand for electricity is kind of the key thing there. And it wasn't just about uranium enrichment, because I think the 1957 was the peak for the uranium enrichment demand. Uh, but just the region was growing. There was a lot more air conditioners uh, being purchased and installed in, in this area of the country. Um, There's a lot more industry moving there. So demand kept growing and TVA needed to meet that demand by, and it chose to build nuclear to do it. So what I'm hearing so far is, you know, hydro dams, big coal plants, big nuclear plants, a lot of really kind of capital intensive projects. Um, how is the TVA being funded sort of over these periods? Um, is it just funding this off the rate base um, and, uh, or, or are there other direct funding mechanisms coming from the federal government? So from the beginning, because it was this um, national government kind of New Deal initiative, the funding came from direct congressional appropriations, largely. Uh, Congress was allowing TVA to use the rates that people were paying, uh, the revenues from that to also help build some stuff, but largely it was congressional appropriations. So it was directly funded by the government in a big way. And over time, they had to kind of pay that back. But that was how it was set up up until the late 1950s, as there was a bit more conservative reaction against the, the now aging New Deal programs. And under President Dwight Eisenhower, Congress passed a, uh, he, he called the TVA creeping socialism. Congress passed a, a law that basically froze TVA's territory in place so that it couldn't geographically expand and threaten local private competition any further than it already did, um, and established what is called the TVA fence. So no one from the outside can kind of poach the customers inside the fence. But at the same time, this, the, this legislative change, it made it so that TVA no longer would get any direct funding for its power operations from the government. Instead, they would issue their own public bonds and sell them on normal bond market to finance the construction of large, of large projects. Um, and so it kind of simultaneously was an attack against TVA, but TVA sort of needed it because they otherwise were having to go to Congress like mm. every year to be like, hey, we need more money for this project. And I, we're gonna get into a little bit in terms of the kind of uh, debt ceilings uh, that were regulated and imposed upon the TVA. Maybe before we do that, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the Adam comes in to challenge King Cole. Uh, just walk us through, I guess, what happens in terms of, you know, how much nuclear they build, what, what kind of percentage uh, this becomes, its impacts um, on you know, decarbonization, and then, you know, more recently, what's, what's being added in terms of capacity. Yeah, the way, the way I phrase it, it almost sounds like it was France. <laughs> what, but what happened? I mean, obviously, there wasn't a huge nuclear transition that killed all the coal initially. Um, so by 1975, TVA kept expanding its forecasts and in, in, in 1975 they found themselves with 17 reactors in various stages of development i think by then maybe a couple were done um across seven different sites so it was a huge organizational endeavor uh it, it almost it's almost bewildering that they thought they could oversee such a massive program um and indeed they kind of bungled it it, it wasn't it was a combination of sort of organizational problems and mismanagement, but also what happened in the early to mid seventies, well, there was a global energy crisis. And mm -hmm. as part of that, so fossil fuels became extremely expensive because of the oil embargo. So some TVA directors at the time, they, they were hoping that the way out of the crisis was an industry would switch from using consuming fossil fueled energy directly to electrifying they consume electrical energy. And so this would drive up demand for TVA electricity. Unfortunately, the real response in the 70s, the energy crisis from firms and from households was just conservation. Let's try to use less energy overall instead of switching to electrical sources. Um, so that meant 
a crashing forecast. And, and maybe TVA was forecasting too ambitiously about what load would look like. But once load was no longer expected to grow, well, now why do you need all these nuclear plants? Why should you continue spending money, ratepayer money, to build these massive nuclear plants if you're not actually going to need all that power? So TVA kind of froze a bunch of the projects, and ultimately they only built um, seven reactors across three sites. And the, the last two were Watts Bar. Watts Bar 1 came online in 1996. It's kind of just frozen on ice for decades. And then Watts Bar Unit 2 came online in 2016. Um, so, and that is all from the original 60s and 70s nuclear program. Yeah, I was I was looking at the uh, a graph of the price of coal um, over time in, in the U.S. and you do see this knock on effect from the oil crisis where it almost doubles. Um, that had big impacts uh, up here in Ontario and was part of the reason that we went nuclear. But I understand the coal industry got their act together pretty quickly and were able to get prices down. Um, and really, you know, Jimmy Carter talked a big game about solar, but uh, built a lot of coal um, during yeah. that period as as a response again. Um. So, you know, where's, I guess, after nuclear, where, where are we at kind of contemporarily? That fizzles, um, maybe some more coal additions, but uh, they're selling a lot of renewables now, gas. What's what's the story? So largely there, there was especially just like everywhere in the American in electrical grid. And I think a lot of the kind of environmental nonprofits like to say this is a TVA only thing, but there's been a lot of switching from coal to gas in the TVA power system over the decades. Uh, including to today. So I mentioned the Kingston coal plant in 1955. It was the world's largest fossil fuel power plant. TVA is, is, is still trying to shut that thing down. It's at the end of its life. It has operational problems. So they're going to build a massive combined cycle gas plant to replace that. Um, so there's a lot of gas. And so to give kind of a sense for this overall picture, 20 years ago, coal was 60% of TVA generated electricity in the TVA bouncing authority. And then last year it was 14%. And so that, that was a huge decrease in coal. Well, nuclear went from 23% 20 years ago to 43% last year. And sometime in the 2010s, I think when Watts Bar Unit 2 came on, it became the dominant source of electricity in TVA instead of coal. But unfortunately, also gas went from 2% in 2003 to 34% last year. Uh, and, and again, as I was saying, it's the same dynamics that played out everywhere else. There's a lot of cheap natural gas suddenly available. Uh, manufacturers are getting really good at building, uh, at designing and building gas combustion turbines, uh, combined cycle plants. So gas really kind of explodes. And TVA has to build, by statute, the least cost resource, not just monetary cost, but also in some vague social sense of cost. This is the the source of power that's least that's uh, least expensive. So this is what we're building to meet demand. So that was largely gas. I understand uh, that uh, there's a lot of critique of TVA from environment. Can you explain that? Yeah, it's, I, I have uh, apparently one of the only perspectives on TVA that doesn't just listen entirely to what they have to say and run with their perspective. Uh, and from what I can see, um, really going back to the, the 19th, 70s when TVA needed to continue asking Congress to raise its debt limit, which again, I, I think we'll get into soon. Um, a lot of that was to build expensive nuclear plants. Well, local Sierra Club and an organization that was a precursor for today's Southern Alliance for Clean Energy really fought in the congressional hearings over this. They fought against having new nuclear. They actually wanted in, in the Sierra Club argued for continuing coal because it was coal country. It was good jobs. Why not use coal? Um, and the other group, they said, well, alternative energy and conservation would be cheaper than nuclear. So that's really kind of the mindset that exists today in the environmental nonprofits. Obviously, they're not arguing for more coal today, but they are saying, hey, conservation and alternative energy, renewables, is cheaper. And it's not the best area for wind, but there could be a lot more solar power on the grid and TVA today. And there's various kind of political and economic reasons why there's not more of it. But the, the gist of their criticism uh, is that TVA, it's, it's, it's not transparent enough about how it plans to build and makes decisions about what to build. And it's choosing gas instead of solar and storage, as if it's just a conservative hostility to renewables that animates TVA's decisions to, to do this. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, like watching until what period uh, natural gas was cool, the environmentalists, um, major 
uh, natural gas donations to Sierra Club. Um, I think those were exposed in the early 2010s, and there's been a little bit of an about face more recently. But um, that that is an interesting phenomenon. Um, okay, so let's let's move a little bit more into this current context and start broaching the topic of uh, new nuclear. Um, yeah. TVA is collaborating with uh, my home province here in Ontario, Ontario Power Generation, on uh, some design and development work for the BWX 300, a small modular reactor. Yeah, let's let's chat a bit about that and then get into, I guess, your central thesis here. Why why the TVA think is well positioned uh, to move forward on nuclear? Yeah, so it, there's uh, there's kind of my my main argument of why TVA, but then there's also what I would call the atomic dilemma at the at the core of it. But to, to go into the, this new nuclear program, this was announced two years ago. TVA said, we see some need for new demand, but largely just a need to retire coal plants. Uh, we think that nuclear will make sense today. So this was in 2022, they announced, hey, SMRs look to be the future where the industry is going. We're gonna collaborate on an SMR project with, as you said, with OPG in Ontario uh, and a Polish industrial group, Synthos. Um, the so as part of the article i interviewed the chief nuclear officer of tva tim roush and we had a long discussion about about all this stuff um the, the smr project it it is what they decided to go with partly because opg opg had a head start and this was a way for tva to partner with them and share some of the risks and designing finishing the design of the reactor but also building a whole plan for how to how to have a site layout, how to construct it, how to staff it, how to deal with the operations, how to deal with the, the regular refueling outages of one of multiple units in a plant. Um, and that's actually something where in this partnership, TVA offers something that OPG doesn't already have, which is expertise with offline refueling, because the OPG can do reactors don't need to be refueled offline, whereas TVAs do. And since the BWRX 300 is basically a scaled down version of the boiling, wa boiling water reactor at Browns Ferry, um, TVA has had OPG staff come and monitor the refueling outages at Browns Ferry to kind of learn not just uh, you know, the mechanics of what needs to be done, but how you organizationally prepare for hundreds of temporary workers and all the components and supplies you need on site to carry that out. Um, so that's kind of part of the partnership. That's a big sticking point with the uh, Canadian unions. Um, again, our our Canada reactors field online, and uh, the maintenance and outages are are done, you know, by local labor because such a supply a, a local supply chain. But um, you know, management's made it pretty clear to those union workers that for the foreseeable future, it would be U.S. roving BWR crews to come in and and refuel, and that only makes sense because every hour you're offline, you're losing tons of potential revenue from selling electricity. Um, but definitely not not popular with the uh, with the unionized workers up up here. So it's yeah. a kind of interesting angle. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. So it's it's really interesting, actually. You know, maybe we can take this opportunity to divert a little bit into the integrated resource plan, um, the uh, DOE liftoff report. Um, you know, interesting document. The liftoff report in particular. Um, again, as I was mentioning, um, Gen three. Uh, pressurized water reactors, light water reactors are uh, now advanced. It's very interesting. Uh, but, you know, I think but comparing this report to previous, um, huge pivot away from um, an SNR dominant paradigm and away from uh, so-called advanced or, or Gen 4, um, and really a, a move and a redirection towards the idea of fleet mode uh, deployment of, of large light water reactors. And, you know, they, they mentioned AP1000, I think 41 times in the text. I, I only I, I was searching for a few terms. I only saw BWX in there one time, uh, again, compared to 41 times or AP1000. So it's a, it's a very different document than the previous liftoff reports. Um, I'm not sure if you want to expand upon that um, <clears throat> or, again, the integrated resource plan from TVA. Yeah, so let me uh, kind of cover both of that by saying what the, the current status of the TVA's new nuclear program is with regards to SMRs. So they're still proceeding with that. They've just raised a bit more money, not financing, not loans, but just allocating ratepayer money, a bit more of it to go to developing the SMR project. And that's just to, to finish the kind of overall design and template, standardized template for, for actually building and deploying one um, and submitting a license 
to the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, for approval. Um, but that was what was kind of laid out two years ago. What happened since then? Well, as you mentioned, carbon-free power project from New Scale it, uh, financially fell apart, and Fogel was finished. So when I talked to Tim Rausch, the chief nuclear officer, I was saying, you know, it, the situation is just different today, and the whole nuclear industry sees it and is talking about it. And your podcast, you know, has helped contribute to this perspective of, wait a minute, maybe we should actually be building more AP one thousands. Um, maybe large nuclear still has an, an important role to play. And he basically exactly confirmed that yes, they also consider an AP one thousand project to be on the table. It is part of their nuclear strategy. He called it a living document of the different options available to them for what kind of nuclear to build. They've been pursuing the SMR project, but when I asked him, okay, well, what would an AP1000 project at TBA look like? He mentioned they still have about eight gigawatts of coal plants to retire. They have a lot of large baseload needs and they have a lot of existing sites. So when I mentioned that they, uh, they canceled some of their nuclear projects, they still have four entire sites that they scoped out and evaluated for seismic conditions, water source, uh, local workforce availability, and location in the transmission system for a big nuclear plant in the 70s. And Belafont is the main one he mentioned as Belafont is extremely valuable today, and it could be the potential site of a large nuclear project like an AP-1000. Um, you know, he was not committing to an AP-1000, but he was basically saying like, this is on the table and this is part of what i am calling the kind of the core atomic dilemma of tva tenure with small modular reactor do you pivot to an ap1000 because tva has extreme rising demand headed to it they're projecting mm -hmm. university study found a 22 percent growth in population by 2050. um wow or do you pursue both perhaps yeah yeah pretty pretty astonishing numbers um i mean in a sense it, it makes sense um you know looking back uh, you know, trying to time travel 10 years back and, and see where the state of the industry was, um, where demand was looking quite flat. Um, finance was a real problem. There was, you know, the idea that only the private sector would, would finance new nuclear. Um, you know, there's been some big changes there, obviously, and the IRA is, is a big part of that. Um, I think also it was not anticipated that so-called hyperscalers would be moving in and, you know, um, reviving things like Unit 1 at Three Mile Island, which closed due to, you know, economic reasons because of uh, cheap gas in the Marcellus field that was kind of right underfoot. Um, you know, and what a testament to uh, the rising social license and pu public perceptions of nuclear. Um, these large tech companies um, studiously kept away from nuclear, you know, even three or four years ago, they were, you know, apparently 100% renewable powered due to some fancy <laughs> accounting renewable energy certificates. Uh, but they wouldn't touch nuclear, then they would only touch advanced nuclear. Um, and now again, bringing back to life, not the melted down unit, but the next door neighbor, um, which I imagine still carries some stigma in the popular imagination. Um, so it just seems like, you know, so many of those precursors and the logic of SMRs is rapidly vanishing. And I'd say, you know, number of things contributing, but really, um, the kind of demand growth that, that is being projected organically. And now also, um, with AI additions is, is really something that. Mm -hmm. You know, without without solid um, predictions of demand growth, you're never going to build an expensive, upfront, high risk capital cost, uh, you know, construction project if you're not sure you're going to have customers for the kilowatt hours out, out the back end of that uh, to to pay back that that long term return on investment and ultimately, you know, amazing, um, uh, you know, cheap power over the course of the lifetime of the plant, but it takes a while to to earn that back. And it makes sense that you wouldn't be adding these big chunky gigawatt additions. Um, if you weren't sure about that, uh, that demand showing up. Um, yep. so anyway, just a few, a few of my reflections, uh, you know, on the state of things. Um, also, I mean, just reflecting on that number, um, like 6 billion for 300 megawatts, uh, SMR, 5.4 5, um, 5. billion. Yeah. Okay. 5.4. So, you know, what are they building gas for, um, right now in, in, in the TVA? Oh, that's, uh, that's a good question. But I, when I looked at, there was a gas plant that replaced a coal plant uh i think last year it was finally brought online and it was roughly a gigawatt and it cost about a billion dollars so wow. significantly cheaper than either an smr or uh, apwr so i mean but and this is part of what uh roush called the rubik's cube they have to solve is they want to build nuclear 
the TVA CEO and president, uh, Jeff Lyash, he wants to build nuclear. He said he would like to, he only wants to build nuclear if he can build 20, which they mean if they can have its standard template for how to build one unit at a time so that they eventually want to reach 20, that's when they would commit to building any nuclear. Um, and labor unions, I, as part of the article, I reported on the perspective of labor unions that represent more than half of the TVA workforce. Uh, together, they represent about 5,000 TVA employees, the IBEW, electrical workers, and the IFPTE, the white collar workers. Um, they want to see near nuclear too. They, all the unions, the, the, all the union reps that I spoke to, they absolutely would like to see an AP 1000 tomorrow in TVA because of the, the growing demand that's needed and the fact that TVA as a mission organization, it's not just a power company. It's not just a state-owned enterprise. It is something that originally and can once again fill U.S. government missions like bringing nuclear industrial capacity back on track. Um, at the same time, these unions do see a role for small modular reactors in the long term, uh, as did that chief nuclear officer. Uh, and so I think there are some operational and technical considerations where those do uh, those do serve value besides just kind of aggregate capacity and energy output. Um, but to, to return to this, the, the numbers again, if TVA's IRP modeled $15 billion per AP1000 unit, well, the liftoff report that was released this morning for a two unit plant, you know, maybe there's uh, with, with some suggestion of possible learnings from Vogel, they estimate what could be about $10 billion per unit. So that's 33% less than what TV estimated. So if there's anyone listening that working in the DOE, I would in the office of nuclear energy, please go talk to TVA and reconcile this huge difference in the modeled costs for an AP-1000, given how much this particular institution could be what helps us get more AP-1000s in America. Mm -hmm. my, my understanding from talking to someone who had some input into that DOE report is that um, getting down to that uh, final cost is uh, building multiple units. Uh, I'm not sure if it's actually at Vogel, like Vogel Unit 5, um, or, you know, it's, but it's certainly kind of nth of a kind, not, not first of a kind cost. So it's, it's sort of after... You know, a significant amount of learning and, and I think reactivation of, of the supply chain. But we are going to have, uh, I believe, Julie Kozaraki on shortly um, to walk oh, us through the, the DOE report. So I will note that and uh, we will uh, we'll follow up. Yes. We had a podcast recently um, with my countryman, uh, Jesse Hoobsch. I can never pronounce his last name well. Uh, but we were reflecting a little bit about, um, you know, what our modern institutions are capable of, of delivering um, in the Western world, um, which has seen a lot of hollowing out of state capacity and a lot of, um, you know, downloading of tasks to the private sector, um, you know, rather than taking out uh, issuing public debt finance, uh, you know, big capital works projects, uh, much easier just to produce uh, feed in tariffs or tax incentives and try and get the private sector to kind of do the work for you. Um, that is amenable to certain technologies. And we've really seen, you know, wind and solar and batteries, uh, to some degree, gas plants uh, taking off as, as a result of that. I guess gas is, uh, you know, it's, it's not super cheap to build, but it's, it's much easier. The private sector can handle it and the economics um, are there in terms of deregulated markets rewarding uh, its ability to capture high prices, et cetera. So anyway, we have this, you know, pretty, uh, you know, extraordinary deployment of wind, solar uh, and gas. Uh, but I mean, I guess we're sort of tapped out of our hydro, um, but nuclear is, is, is not sort of moving forward. So, um, again, I, I think you, you sort of frame this a little bit, but in terms of TVA being in a sort of unique role to, uh, to do this, um, maybe you can flesh out a, a little bit further. Yeah. So TVA, um, it's not just a public power system. Uh, it's an idea. No, I'm, I'm kidding. It's, it's. Since 1959, since I mentioned that there was this kind of cutoff from federal appropriations for its power op for its power operations, continue to get appropriations for other things until the late 90s, I believe. Um, it's it's had this ability to issue bonds like any kind of public authority in the country, whether it's housing, power related, water, whatever. It can issue bonds and finance its long term interests, long term infrastructural needs. Um, that the, those bonds are basically a way for them to get low cost debt finance stuff. 
using debt for long-term financing, um, I, I guess it's just very different from shifting all the risk onto whatever some private competitive firms can see from a bunch of open public price signals on a power market and then take on risks to, uh, to, to invest in something to bring it online because they think they can capture some of that market. Uh, so TBA represents kind of this older fashioned way of doing it, but also kind of any investor owned utility also has a similar capacity that it has the institutional capacity to have these long-term contracts and these long-term infrastructure development because they know they have a customer base that can't just up and leave. They know they have a state franchise for this territory. I'm going to know that I will have customers I can bank on. I can literally take to the bank a guarantee that I will be serving roughly this much power, really serving this, um, uh, this territory of power for uh, decades to come. Uh, my collaborator, Matt Huber, and I, we had an essay uh, earlier this year in Damage Magazine, The Utility of Utilities, which we talked about on the Odd Lots podcast, for example. And we kind of, you know, we are both advocates of public power and the kind of TVA model. But at the same time, if we want nuclear, or even if we want offshore wind, as we give in that essay, you need these institutions of the utilities to be able to finance the big things by uh, by taking on all the, by sort of socializing the risk of all that. Now, the downside to this approach is the VC Summer Project in South Carolina, which was an AP1000 project that fell apart. Uh, it didn't get finished. The executives went to jail. They're serving prison time in some cases for lying to the public and lying to regulators about the project. Um, so it's, it's kind of this interesting question of, do we have an institutional model for this big infrastructure needs that are optimizing for making progress and incentivizing firms to, uh, to profit off of building and growing? Or do we want to optimize for not having anyone be saddled with the risk of something failing? And right. there's kind of this creative destruction in the market where it's really good for not saddling people with that sort of risk. But at the same time, it's also not good for building these big things. Right, right. And, you know, full disclosure, I mean, nuclear's maybe, maybe there's an example of, of a hydroelectric project doing this. But to my knowledge, nuclear is uh, the only uh, technology that has bankrupted a regulated monopoly utility, despite that rate base. Uh, things, things can go spectacularly wrong in terms yeah. of financing these big projects. And, and so in public power some... systems, not just like, you know, the evil capitalists. Mm hmm. So in terms of, um, you know, being able to uh, issue bonds and, and debt, um, can the TVA do that sufficiently for these rather large numbers we're hearing um, for either SMRs or, uh, or large nuclear? Yeah, so that is the, the, the really core next part of what is the atomic dilemma at, at play here. Um, and that's something that I tried to really bring attention to in the article because it's really not common knowledge. It's like how, how the TVA financing and all that works. So... If TVA since 1959 can issue bonds um, to, to finance construction, well, it can only do it up to a certain amount. I, I forget what it was initially, but throughout there are multiple periods in the 1960s up until 1979, Congress expanded the debt limit or the debt ceiling that it says, TVA, you can issue bonds to take on this amount of statutory uh, of, of debt in this nominal amount of dollars. And when it was raised in, last raised in 1979, this was as part of uh, developing the financial capacity to build, finish building some of its nuclear plants, it was raised to $30 billion. And again, that's a nominal value. So it's still in law today that TBA can only issue bonds up to $30 billion outstanding debt. If that kept pace with inflation, it would be something like $130 billion today. Uh, so TBA only has about $10 billion of debt left outstanding that it can use to finance anything right now. Um, how do you build anything that we were just talking about for 10 billion? You know, maybe the AP or an SMR could ultimately cost 5.4 billion. It's, you know, that's kind of risky. TVA faces a need to raise its debt limit. It needs to be able to finance some large construction or for hopefully for a new nuclear, but perhaps for anything at this point. And Debt is a very different political subject today for TVA compared to what it was during the even the 1950s and even 1960s and even the 1970s. 
1979, there were liberals in Congress who were still committed to the idea of TVA being this big public institution. Hey, it needs its own financial capacity to do to build big things. These liberals don't exist in Congress today. Conservatives also are, are they don't want to see TVA grow. They don't want to use the scary D word to take on more debt for this. Debt has been kind of politically defeated today. And all the people that want TVA just to build renewables, well, TVA doesn't need debt for that because it's signing PPAs with third party renewables developers. And when you're signing, when you're buying power through these PPAs, the power purchase agreements, you're not financing capital uh, projects. You're just buying it on a kind of monthly basis of, of the power output. So the progressives who have been trying to steer TVA to merely build renewables are part of the problem of taking away or politically minimizing the core tool that TVA has in the toolbox to build big public projects. Um, so TVA needs and, to, and to indeed, raise the debt limit. Yep. And, and indeed, they're not in favor of TVA raising the debt limit. From what yes, I understand. They're, they're not. So I asked um, a couple of these, these uh, kind of, it's, it's sort of like, it's called the green blob. There's sort of these amorphous different environmental nonprofits. They have some of the main shared funding sources. They're always on different uh, legal cases and stuff together. But I, I talked to a few of them. Do you support TVA raising the debt limit to help pay for new nuclear? And the, the ones I spoke to said, no, they don't. They generally don't want it raised at all, but they especially don't want it to be raised for nuclear. Um, the other core problem is that if TVA, even if TVA, if Congress raises the debt limit, TVA can now finance a giant nuclear plant. That still means that the, all the costs, the capital, the cost of capital, but everything would fall on all the ratepayers. Now, as a TVA executive said in an ANS event this summer, TVA's legacy is an impoverished area of serving it and modernizing it and developing it. They don't want to saddle all the people in the Tennessee Valley area with higher electricity bills than they're already getting just to, to build new nuclear, to take on this mission, you know, hey, everyone, do it for America. Like, it, it's already kind of unfortunate that that's a position that Georgia ratepayers are in. So what TVA really needs is supplementary funding from some source to lower the overall costs that they need to borrow and, and to, to build all this stuff to help them get this, whether, whether it's big nuclear or small nuclear, to help see it forward. They need supplementary funding. Right. I mean, interesting um, hearing, you know, some titans of venture capital, Bill Gurley and Brad Gertner on uh, the BG Squared podcast uh, filmed in the, well, in the uh, simulation control room of Diablo Canyon. They did, they did a great episode on, on nuclear but sort of calling for something like an Apollo project for the federal government um, to not let us fall so far behind Russia and China on this strategic and geopolitically important technology and some find, find some way to kickstart it. Now, um, we've talked about the possibility of increasing the debt limit for TVA and how that might be politically challenging or difficult. Uh, another alternative is um, probably similar to what we saw, the deal between Constellation and Microsoft to restart mm -hmm. TMI Unit 1. Um, what do you see in terms of the prospects, um, the positives, the negatives of hyperscalers getting in and um, if not uh, helping to finance, at least offering um, lucrative uh, power purchase agreements in order to de-risk uh, the capital investments necessary for, say, a new large uh, nuclear plant? Yeah, um, I will I'll start off by giving a quote I loved from the 10th District International Vice President of the Electrical Workers Union. Um, regard on the prospect of TVA getting supplementary funding from a private source like big, a big tech company. This would be the beginning of the end of public power. That's what, that's what he, he thought. Um, my perspective is much more aligned with that of the unions. They want new nuclear. They, their kind of institutional concern is that whatever new nuclear project comes online, however it's financed, whoever's kind of owning that the same collective bargaining agreements that governs any TVA project be applied to that. But more politically and ideologically, they want it to be TVA. They do not want um, Bill Gates or uh, you know any of the, the Google people, Elon Musk, et cetera, to, be, to have their, their name stamped on a new TVA nuclear plant. They see TVA as this core, as you point it, like a NASA-like institution for America they want public power to be to serve the Valley's residents and their kind of economic development. They don't want it to be just serving some whatever 
giant big tech firm managed to cut a deal with them. They, uh, and that's in contrast to the, the Three Mile Island deal. And again, like they want the nuclear online, it, it, but it's they want to maintain TVA the way it, it its legacy has been to, to be able to have the institutional capacity financially and technically to build these big projects. Um, the IFPTE president, he said, TVA is a shining gem that should stay the way it is. And I agree with that. I, I think I didn't really go in an article into what are the downsides if TVA gets, let's say, um, you know, half the financing they need comes from some new kind of public-private partnership with Microsoft to, to, help, to help finance it. First of all, that has never really been done for any TVA big capital project. I mentioned TVA is largely building out renewables. These are being built by private developers. TVA buys the power from PPAs. But those are very small projects. Those are not massive, heavy in infrastructure that pushes science and technology forward. And so it would be a shame, I think, if, if TVA could not just get the funding it needed from the government to, that to not saddle all of the Valley residents with the costs involved of first or second or third of a kind nuclear plants. Um, but I would say there's a concern that if, if TVA, if a new nuclear plant, let's say it's half owned by some big tech buyer, uh, or its output is half owned by that, can the US government, like it did during the New Deal and during World War II and so on, direct TVA's power operations in the national or public interest if it's committed to satisfy some contracts with some shareholders at Microsoft and what they want out of it. This is a public resource and it should stay yeah, public. Yeah. It's interesting. There was uh, some criticism of the TMI deal by folks saying, hey, you know, it was ratepayers who put in the blood, sweat and tears to bring, you know, the, the three mile unit one online to begin with. And now, um, you know, it's being usurped by by big tech. Um, and that there should be some benefit back um, to the rate payer, um, you know, even if it's, you know, historical contribution that they made, there's a legacy there that's important. Um, yeah. You know, I guess another question that comes up is, you know, in a context um, of, you know, rapidly rising electricity demand, largely driven by AI, um, if there are shortages or a squeeze um, on the available electricity, you know, if this is a supply and demand uh, setup here, then electricity prices could go up. There's a conflict here between big power users um, in, in the tech and the hyperscaling space, um, and, and the, the, the rate payer. And you wonder kind of who wins in terms of, um, the power each can leverage. I, I had Mark Mills on recently. He said, you know, don't worry, like the rate payer, um, will always win because it's just so politically contentious. If you were to steer power away from, uh, rate payers and residents towards, um, you know, large industry. And we do see that with industrial load shedding, obviously, as a, as a bit of a demand response tool. Um, it strikes me that um, these data centers are a little less flexible, I would imagine, in terms of uh, demand response and just being able to shut them down. Um, and this is all without getting into the maybe not so sci-fi world of, you know, um, alignment in AI, and, you know, whether AI can just sort of take over and, and take all the power at once for itself. Uh, so leaving aside that sort of dystopian, uh, maybe not so science fiction future, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? And I, I don't want to use the term like electricity apartheid, but like, I'm trying to convey something here in terms of the, the conflicting interests of the ratepayer versus the hyperscaler um, and what public versus private versus public private ownership uh, of these these new assets, um, you know, what the what the repercussions might be. Yeah, it's I mean, it's an excellent question. I would say let, if we abstract beyond TVA for a moment, if the power system, if investments in the power system and especially as we're trying to decarbonize and create new clean energy resources and so on. If these are all being directed by whatever kinds of price signals for whatever kinds of financial commodities like renewable energy certificates or what have you uh, can be created, for this or the, that kind of market on the exchanges, um, if these investment decisions are all being done by companies like Microsoft, completely divorced from any institutional governmental uh, or just like state capacity for planning, for aligning the interests of the uh, of the public and also of, of industry into certain kinds of things. So if it's just this private matter of firms competing on markets and they get all to say, I think that's not good. And you know, maybe that's exactly what has let Microsoft uh, 
revive Three Mile Island, to, to convince Constellation to revive it, rather. Um, but it is not what I think is the right direction. I, For one, I think it's also in part predicated on Microsoft's desire for 24-7 clean energy certificate. Why do they desire that? Well, their shareholders currently, today, desire that. Are they going to keep continue desiring that? I don't know. If, if they don't, then does the business case for the new nuclear just go away? Do we go back to just gas? So I am in favor of state regulated utilities or some other kind of administrative capacity in the state to help shape these investments. And if any firm shareholders are going to be involved in it, I think it makes sense that it be utility industry, since they're the ones having to also plan upgrades to the transmission and distribution systems alongside all that. Now, specific to the TVA, um, there already are political concerns that TVA is, you know, it's, it's just doing everything for industrial customers. Every big tech company has data centers there. Elon Musk just built a, is in the process of building a massive, massive um, XAI data center in Memphis that is going to be ultimately mm -hmm. using TVA power. Um, people are already concerned that anything TVA does, it is just for these, you know, big, big capitalist bad guys and so on. I, I mean, I would say, as I said earlier, the industrial customers to utilities or to TVA are an important part of helping grow RID as a socialized thing. Now it's not socialized as in government owned, um, you know, okay, TVA, TVA is, but uh, it, it's more socializing it to the public interest. And if you have some kind of institutional body that helps mediate between what is being done for industry and what are these standard tariffs and prices and their cost sharing compared to the, the people, then that is going to be far preferable to whatever is the biggest fish cut, whatever special deals it wants with any provider anywhere in the country. I think that sucks. Um, and this is where something I will concede to what I would call the environment, like the main environmental critics of TVA is that there is not, I would say, perhaps an adequate institutional body that is a separate and independent and trusted oversight body to approve rate increases and so on for these things, like there mm -hmm. is at state level. But it is part of what we need to have going forward. Yeah, I mean, when you're describing the historic project of the TVA and its role in developing a very economically depressed area, rural electrification, uh, powering you know big factories, um, those are very different uh, than than powering data centers. And you know, there's been a number of jurisdictions around the world that are um, you know in the context of limited power banning data centers because they don't employ a lot of people. You know, compared to yeah. a kind of World War II era heavy manufacturing. Uh, you know, industry, it's, it's quite the contrast. So absolutely. Um, that's interesting. But I think you're, you are describing sort of a, a political battle here. Um, you're stating a kind of preference as a, as a public intellectual. Um, maybe I'll just close on this because I thought it was interesting. I heard that under Obama, there was attempts to privatize the TVA. Um, and it sounds like the, the unions are probably at the forefront of, of fighting that off. Uh, do you think the unions are going to play a big role in terms of you know, answering this, this huge question and this, you know, divergence of potential paths forward? Yeah, so Obama and Trump both at various times floated the prospect of their privatizing TVA entirely, or Trump proposed privatizing the transmission system and of exposing TVA to market competition. That is what environmental critics also want. They want more of TVA power system to be sort of open price signals on the market, uh, to encourage competition. And they, they see it as a big monopoly, just like as if it was, uh, you know, big capital power and light Inc. I would say part of my, what I'm trying to do here, uh, I, I'm not a journalist. I'm just a, a guy who has political and intellectual passions and can do some research and writing. I want to argue that the political coalition help make TVA be what I'm saying it should be for nuclear and generally going forward. Labor unions are an essential part of that. Um, there are really two core institutions outside of TVA that are vying for the future of this organization today. One are these labor unions who are uh, looking after the industrial interests of modernizing, of building sufficient demand, of TVA as a productive power system, and also one that is, a, is for the people. And then the other are the environmental critics that really just seem to only want more renewables and reject nuclear, they, they want to just stimulate competition. 
Um, and, and again, I think they do have some fair criticisms on top of that. Um, I'm trying to argue that the labor union should be part of this. If you look at any kind of uh, liberal-minded, progressive-minded, politician, media, all of that at a national level, when they comment on TVA, they're quoting all these environmental groups. They're never quoting unions. I am trying mm -hmm. to say the unions are an essential part of this coalition and the media and everyone else should pay attention to them, but also TVA itself should. It's, it's very interesting, the, the strength of the union movement, um, particularly in nuclear dominant uh, systems. Uh, and it, it, you know, I think it derives directly from the fact that it's a large centralized workplace that's easier to organize um, with stable kind of intergenerational work. Um, that's kind of what a lot of um, you know, our industrial past was like. Um, and we've, we've seen that really disrupted, obviously, as we transition to a more financialized and, and service economy. So it sounds like there's some sort of bastions of strength there in terms of the union movement within the TVA. Is there like a high rate of, of unionization in, in that area compared to the rest of the U.S. South or, or other? Yeah, SCW? I mean, the TVA employees are, I think, 58 percent covered by union contracts. That is insane for that part of the country in particular. I think yeah. that the current uh yeah utilities in general are like 20 percent, if i remember correctly across the country so th this is a very high union density but there is not the needed political bodies advocacy organizations etc that are working with them to advance the interests of repowering tva the ways i'm talking about and that's what i would appeal to your listeners help join with the labor unions to make these arguments on behalf of tva because i'm telling you there is no think tank, no 501c3, no 501c4, that is doing that. It needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, Fred, we'll leave it on that note. Um, pleasure talking with you for the second time. Um, and again, with the, uh, the hindsight of uh, these recent developments, uh, the flooding, um, the DOE liftoff report, uh, Tennessee Valley authorities, integrated resource planning. Um, I think those are the big, big three or four. Um, so yeah, looking forward to seeing this develop and looking forward to, uh, to reading more of your pieces and having you back on, on the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Chris. This is great. Cool.